this is the first session of a conference that I'm greatly expecting for my heart. And as I was preparing for this time, I didn't feel God wanted me to come and talk about equipping this morning. I felt God wanted me to come talk about empowering. Because so often as saints, we want to run to the equipping. We want to run to the how-to. How do I drive out demons? How do I counsel? How do I work? How do I administrate? Teach me how to lead my community. Teach me how to lead the church. And we forget the one thing that is really, really important. We forget the thing that it's, is at the core of our Christianity. And just like you've come here in the first session this morning, I'm going to talk about our love of Christ. And Christ loves for us. Because that's where each and every one of our stories started, isn't it? Before I was out in the world, I was doing my own thing. But at some point, Christ arrested my heart. Jesus stopped me in my tracks. And he took out my heart of stone and he put inside of my heart heart of flesh. And from that moment on, I was never, ever, ever the same again. You guys experienced that? So maybe you've experienced this. That even as a Christian, I find that sometimes I get so dry. I find that sometimes that I run out of the life of God as I'm busy with the things of God, as I'm busy serving his people. Do you guys find that? And I think this morning what the Lord is wanting to say to us is, is, is come back. Come back to your first love. Because that is where you will find the power. That is where you will find the life. And that is where you will find the equipping as the anointing of God rests upon your life and breaks the yoke and teaches you. And so this morning what I want to speak about is, I want to speak about finding life in the Father's love. Finding life in in the Father's love. And maybe you have been finding your life in other places. And I want to say there's a Pharisee that came to Jesus in John 10, 26, and he asked this question, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I want to say it's a central question in that chapter 10 of Luke, because Jesus addresses this question of life. Where do we find life? And it's right almost slap bang in the middle of the 40, what's it, 26, 42 verses that, or 52 verses that we find there. And maybe you've walked in your Christian walk and you've run out of life. You know, I've known Jesus for 26, 24 years now. And periodically I find that I run out of life. And I'm sure you found the same. And sometimes I find that in my own life, I run to, like in the first portion of Luke, Jesus sends out the 72 and they go into the area and they cast out demons and they pray for the sick and they heal them and the blind see and the deaf hear. And they come back to Jesus rejoicing. And Jesus says to them, don't rejoice because the demons are subject to you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And at the end of that chapter, we see the the, the story of Mary and Martha. I always get the two confused. Who's Mary and Martha? Like Mary sitting at Jesus' feet and just enjoying Jesus' presence. And Martha is busy in the kitchen preparing the best meal because she just wants to serve Jesus. She loves Jesus. There's nothing wrong with her heart. And then at some point, she gets a little bit fed up. And she's like, I also want to sit at Jesus' feet. And so she goes and she complains. She says, Jesus, tell Mary to come and help. And what does Jesus say? Mary has chosen the better portion, the portion that will not be taken away from her. And I feel like this morning, if you've been busy with the things of God, if you've been busy with the power of God, and you've run out of life, you must prepare yourself for ministry this morning. At the end of the session, I believe the Holy Spirit is going to come and He's going to touch hearts and He's going to touch minds. He's going to break down lies that the enemy has put inside of our heads that tells us that God doesn't love, that God doesn't care, that we should fear Him, that we're not precious in His sight and that we wandered off and that there's no hope for us. Some of us sitting here this morning have got that in our hearts. And God is wanting to come and help you to correct the helmet of your salvation so that you can see God in the correct light, so that you can live from a place of life. Because God wants you to have life, and that life in abundance. And some of our hearts have grown cold. And we're tired, and we're weary, and we're worn out. And we're wondering, where is the passion? Where is the joy of my salvation that I once felt? And so what I want to bring to you guys this morning is I want to bring to you four pictures of how God feels about you, what God thinks about you. And so I want to start with just a little bit of my own story, if you don't mind. 
I grew up in a divorced home. And I had a lovely stepfather, but um, because I grew up in a divorced home, I was pretty broken. And uh, at a young age in my life, I tried to find life in things other than Jesus. I mean, I, we did the drinking and the drugs, and, the, and yet it never quite satisfied me. But what, it, the, what the effect that it had in our household was this. I mean, my, I don't know how my parents did this. But sometimes they would go away for weekends. I was about standard eight, nine, ten, you know, and then when you'd like really naughty, hey, Brad. No, no but oh, you're a pastor's kid. <laughs> a PK. And they would leave me and my friends alone at home. And then what we would do is, is like we would invite all our friends over and we would have like a, a lacquer braai and we would just party. But you know that the week following that party, like, you know, after you've picked up all the stompies and you've made sure that all the bottle caps are gone and, and so on. Is there anyone that can relate with me? You... No. I know Will can. <laughs> I know your story, Will. But you know what it did with my relationship with my father? Nothing wrong with my father, but it caused me to live in fear. And so I would remember that, that week following those parties, whenever the phone rang, I would be petrified. Maybe it's the neighbor calling to tell my dad what we were up to. Or maybe it's someone at school, or maybe someone got caught by their parents, and now they're calling my parents. And so I lived in fear. And what it did to me was, is it, it broke down my relationship with my father, so that I didn't really have a relationship with my father. And I want to say to you, this, that's what fear will do to you. And sometimes we have that type of relationship out of fear with our Heavenly Father. And we battle to relate with Him. Can we please get on the board, Romans 8 verse 15? I did get 16. Thank you very much. Oh, no, no, no. It's Romans 8. Did I give you the scripture, Romans 8? All right. There we go. For you did not receive, receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And I remember I battled to relate with my Father. And when I met Jesus, I battled to relate with my Heavenly Father. So much so, I've been following Jesus now for 24 years. And this year, God brought me to a space where I, once again I ran into this like dry place. And I, my heart was filled with a lot of fear. And what it did was it just like squeezed the life of God out of me. And I got together with some of our friends and we did some app. We call it Applied Prophetic Prayer. And these acts, we prayed and we broke off so many of the wounds that I received from my father. Mostly of, of my own doing. And I just want to say to you this morning that it is really, really important that we know that God has come to take away our sin and to take away our fear. Why was I afraid of my dad? I was afraid because it was naughty. I was afraid of the consequence. I was afraid of his anger. I was afraid of his wrath. So now the Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory. And Christ has come to be a sacrifice for us so that we no longer have to fear God, but we can love God. If you're sitting in this place this morning and you fear God, you're seeing God in the wrong light. And so the Bible says in uh, 1 John 2 verse 2, that he has come to be a propitiation for all who believe. He has come to be a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And that's the first picture that I want to start with this morning, is this picture of propitiation. Now, propitiation is a big word, but it means a sacrifice that turns away wrath, a sacrifice that turns away anger. So I'm going to give you a little illustration. You know, I love my wife. Where's my wife? There's my wife. And we've been married for, we disagree on this, but I think, I say 11 years. She says 10. Am I right? I can't remember now. And our anniversary is a really special day for us. But imagine... Uh, and I mostly remember it. And so imagine this, 
You know, we've got a surf spot close to us, and I'm gonna, probably going to get killed for this, but it works very infrequently, only on the east swell, only on a spring low tide. It probably I've lived in Mosbane for five years, and I've only been able to surf there four times. And on this day of our anniversary, this place is working. Now, what we did is that we booked a restaurant and a movie, and it's in George, you know, so Mosbane Bay, George is about half an hour drive. You need to leave at at least 6 o'clock to make it for the 7 o'clock movie. And so, you know, I said, honey, I'm going to go for a quick surf and I'll be back. And, and I'm in the water and I lose track of time and I'm enjoying it so much that when I look on my watch, I realize, oh, shucks. It's already 10 past 6. And so on the way home, I know that I'm in trouble. You go, can you husbands relate to this? You know that you are in trouble, big trouble. But I've learned from Jesus, and so what I do is, is on my way home, I just swing past the spa, and I go and I buy a bunch of roses. A bunch of red roses. And now we've got an electric gate, and as the electric gate opens, I know that you'll hear the gate opening. And so the gate opens, and, and I drive in, and I climb out my car, and I, I, I crawl on my knees. <laughs> towards the front door and it's it's quite a way so so I'm just taking my time you know like a bride or like a funeral hearse procession and as I get to the door Irina opens up the door and I can see I'm in trouble and so what I do is I say love I'm so sorry I'm late I bought you these wonderful flowers. And in that moment, when she sees these flowers, what happens to her heart is she forgets about her anger towards me. <laughs> well, that's, that's the theory. <laughs> and what happens is she embraces me and says, Oh, you know, honey, you can go watch. We can go watch the movie tomorrow. Let's just go out somewhere here in Mossel Bay. And our relationship goes on happily ever after. <laughs> what is propitiation? It's that bunch of flowers. It's the sacrifice that turns away the anger of God. And the Bible says that God's wrath is coming onto the world because of the actions of sinful and wicked men. And me and you, us, we were once those men. But if you fail to realize that God is no longer angry with you, that in Jesus, He never looks at you in anger. He always looks at you in love. Say with me, Jesus looks at me in love. In love, never in anger. And I just want to qualify a little bit. Does that mean we never get disciplined by God? No, it doesn't mean we never get disciplined. But God never disciplines us out of anger. He disciplines us out of love. And so the wrath of God has been poured out upon His Son, Jesus Christ, the cup of His wrath that has been stored up against godless men so that we could live in relationship with the Father and with Jesus. And if you, like me, have fear in your heart. I had a bad relationship with my dad because of fear, because of my wrongdoing. But now we have a great relationship as I've grown older and I don't do naughty things anymore. <laughs> and so that's God's heart for you. And so the first picture I want you to remember that if you ever feel fear, if you ever feel condemned, if you ever feel left out, if you ever feel like there's no hope for me, remember the flowers. Jesus is the lily of the field. He's the rose of Sharon was offered for you so that you could come without fear, without fear into the Father's presence, without fear. We want to have no space and room for fear in our hearts and in our minds because of the love of Christ. The second thing that I, I feel like we need to fix into our minds is not just the roses, but Jesus tells three parables in John, uh, Luke 15, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son. And the parable of the lost sheep is there's 100 sheep and 99 are safe 
and one wanders off. And the shepherd goes and he finds this one sheep that has wandered off. Oh, we're good. Thank you. And, you know, I want to ask you guys this question. What do you think your purpose as a Christian is? What's your purpose as a Christian? Can I, you can interact with me. I know I'm high. I'm afraid I'm going to fall off here. Love God, make disciples, worship. Any others? Relationships. Anything else? You know, because in Isaiah 53 verse 6 it says that all us like sheep have gone astray and we, as each one of us has gone our own way. And this thing of shepherding in Israel is different to this thing of shepherding in the Western world. In the Western world, we shepherd by chasing with motorbikes and with dogs and buckies and you know, like we drive the sheep forward. But in Jesus' day, the flocks were much smaller and the sheep knew the shepherd's voice. And so the shepherd would call the sheep and he would know them by name, just like Jesus knows you by name. And he would call and he says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow and so the shepherd would call his sheep and he would walk in front and he would lead them into pastures, he would lead them into life. And often what we think eternal life is, is we've got this funny way of thinking about eternal life. It's like in the future. In the future, I'm going to have eternal life. But God wants you to have perpetual life. That is life from the past, life from the now, and life into the future. Because Jesus hasn't died to give you a moment in the future. Because if you live for a moment in the future, you will always be living in the future, preparing yourself for something that is going to happen and not something that has already happened. And what has already happened is, is that your heart of stone has been taken out of your chest. You've been given a heart of flesh. You've been given an inclination to follow Jesus. And the biggest miracle of it all is you've been given the Spirit that calls out, Abba, Father inside of your heart. And so our purpose is not to do something or to be something or to do something in the future or to wait until I get to heaven. Our purpose each day is to walk with God. That is your purpose. That is why you have been saved. That is why you have been called. That is why God's got plans and a purpose and a destiny for your life. And you will not walk in it if you look to the future, you will only walk in it like Abraham. Go to a place that I will show you. And so, if you've been living in the future, if you've been waiting for a moment to happen, that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that he causes living rivers of living water to flow from your innermost being. It comes from the inside and it runs to the outside. Many of you have have come from out of town, and the rest of you that haven't come from out of town, you've gone on road trips together, eh? Got with some friends in the car, maybe people that you haven't known, and after that trip, do you know those people? You know them very well. I mean, me and Ian, Ian was here, is here in the overflow room, I was Ian. Now, I can Ian, it's someone Len and he, and he uh, sorry, me and Ian, I almost, <laughs> sorry, I'm Afrikaans. So, we went on a trip to Zambia, and before, you know, Zambia is far away, you, you guys know, Espe especially in a Hilux bus with 12 guys in it, and I was sitting in the back corner like this, and Ian was sitting opposite me, and um, I'm telling you, by the time we got to the north of South Africa, I had heard, had heard every one of his army stories. <laughs> and, and they're good, maybe he can tell you some of the, in, at break. But the point is, is that Jesus wants us to go on a trip with him. That's the purpose of your Christianity. Jesus wants you to go on a road trip with him. He wants to get into your, the car of your life. He's not going to take the steering wheel. He's your father, not your mother. <laughs> He's not going to come and take control of your life. I tell you what you must wear and when you must brush your teeth. But he's going to come sit right next to you and he's going to lead you and guide you through the power of his spirit. And if you listen to him daily, you will end up in your destination. And on the way there, 
you are going to become best friends. For eternal life is this, that you may know God and Him through whom you were sent. And if you've thought Christianity is about anything other than that, you've missed the pot. Whoa. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that doesn't translate, eh? And Afrika, and Afrika say you report misgestet. What do you say in English? You've missed the plot. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sure my English teacher, if she's around, I hope she's not here today. <laughs> but life is about this. It's about companionship with Christ. It's <laughs> Amen. Then the next parable is about the parable of the lost coin. And Jesus tells a story. It's about a woman that loses a coin, one of ten, in her house. And she spends the whole day looking for it. Now, when we think house, their houses were different. They were stones that were packed together, basically no windows, no doors, very dark in there. And she would have been on her hands and knees the whole day in the cracks and the crevices trying to find that coin. And when she finds that coin, she rejoices. And I want to say, sometimes you feel like your life isn't precious. You feel like you are an accident. You feel like you haven't been called, and you feel like you haven't got purpose. But you've got purpose because Christ has called you. And in Psalm 137, it says, where is it? 139, thank you, sorry. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in the secret and intricately woven in the depths of your heart. Maybe just jump to the last two verses that I gave you. Um, Jump over. Ah, yeah, this is it. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of the days that were formed. I want to say to you, if you are alive and if you are breathing, then God has got a plan, a purpose, a destiny, and a call for your life. It says there that before you were born, that every day was written in his book. I want to say to you, you are not an accident. Jy is nie a karafaan baba nie. I'm sorry, that doesn't translate. <laughs> you are not a, 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 a backseat baby. <laughs> you are not unplanned. You are not unwelcome. And in God's sight, you are precious. You are so precious in His sight that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who was in heaven, being worshipped by the angels, who emptied Himself of His godliness and took on the form of a servant to come and serve you and me so that we could be found because you and I were lost. And maybe you're here in this place this morning and you are lost. And the reason you are lost is because you're not hearing the voice of God. If you don't hear the voice of God, if you don't have the Spirit inside of you saying, witnessing with your Spirit, Abba Father, then maybe you need to start preparing yourself to meet Jesus. Because you can't be His companion. And you're probably still living in fear. And you probably think that you're worthless. And that you've got no purpose and destiny. It's all because you haven't received the Spirit. And this morning, at the end of this meeting, we're going to give you an opportunity to respond to Jesus and get Him to come and live in your heart. And so you're precious in God's sight, the lost coin. You've got much worth because His Son, Jesus Christ, came and died for you to ransom you from sin. And the last one is the parable of the prodigal son. And in this story, there's two sons. There's an older son and a younger son. And the older son gets double portion and the younger son gets single. And the younger son goes to the father and he says to him, give me my inheritance so that I can go and live wildly. And so the younger son's orphan. He says he goes to a foreign land 
and he parties. And he loves it and he enjoys it. You guys, partying's nice, eh? It is. It is nice. I mean, taking drugs isn't bad. People don't use drugs because it's slack or drink because it's bad. But what sin does to you is it causes you to end up in the pigsty. And even though it satisfies you in the moment, in the morning you have a hangover. Anyone relate? I remember. And so what sin will do to you, and just a quick picture, send it to Samson, it'll cut your hair, it'll disempower you, and they poked out his eyes, it'll blind you, and they put him on a millstone, and he was walking around doing the work of a donkey. So sin comes, it disempowers you, it blinds you, it makes you go around in circles. And you go around, and I never have breakthrough. Why don't I have breakthrough in my finances? Why don't I have breakthrough in my relationship with my wife? Why don't I have breakthrough in my relationship with my children? Why, why, why? And as a pastor, I often find when, we work, when I work with people, and I've seen this in myself as well, it's, it's very difficult for us to recognize in ourselves. And so we often we want to get out of those circles and say, you know what, I'm going to move town or I'm going to move church or I'm going to move country. And over there it's going to be better. Have you guys thought that? I've thought that I was going to go to America. You know the problem is? Is you always take yourself wherever you go. <laughs> That's the one person you cannot get away from. And so maybe you're in your third marriage or in your fourth marriage. And you're just wondering, God, don't you want me to love? Don't you want me to experience a good marriage? And God's saying this morning to you, stop. Just stop. Come back to me. Come listen to me. Don't go around the mountain. Come to me. And the story of the prodigal son is is that the prodigal son realizes that he's going to go nowhere. He's stuck in this pigsty. He's eating the peels. And he realizes that even in his father's house, the servants eat better than that. And so he, he starts walking back. And the amazing thing is this, is that when the father sees him coming, now you've got to know he's coming with a lot of guilt and shame. Have you guys ever done something wrong? It's hard to relate with people like when there's that uh, in between you, eh? And he's coming with all this guilt and shame. And I can just imagine this. This young man walking. And I mean, if you think about it, he asked his father for the inheritance. So he was probably a a party oak from the beginning, you know. And so the whole town must have known about this oak. Yeah, yes. He's rolled his third car this year. He's just a spoiled brat. And I can just imagine the town as he's coming down the road. Go, yeah, see, we knew that he wouldn't make it. We knew that he was a loser. We knew he wasn't going to amount to anything. Didn't we say that? And that shame and that guilt that was being heaped upon him, the amazing thing is this, is that the father, what does the father do? The father sees the son coming, and the father realizes that everyone's heaping shame and guilt upon this young man. And he picks up his robe, and he runs. Now, people, this is something that we need to understand, that in those days old men didn't run. And so as this father runs to go fetch his child, the eyes of the town gets taken off the son and gets put upon the father. And so what the father does for the son is is he takes the guilt, he takes the shame upon himself. And the Bible says that our shame and our guilt has separated us. And maybe you sitting here this morning And you've got things that you cannot forgive yourself for. There's things that you've done that you think never under heaven will God forgive me. And I want to say to you that there is no sin. There is nothing that will separate you from the love of Christ that is in God the Father. Not height, nor depth, nor angels, nor demons, nor anything else in all creation will separate you from the love of the Father in Christ Jesus. And so if you're sitting here this morning and you carrying guilt and shame, I want to say to you that Jesus nailed that thing on the cross and at the cross it was dealt with. It was over. It was finished. Jesus says it is finished. And you can go free. 
But the thing is, is if you keep on holding on to your shame, it will keep on having that effect in your life. And you will never walk into the relationship and the destiny and the purpose. You know what? Like, I find this when I've done something wrong, it's hard for me to, to, to connect because the guilt and the shame pulls me away. I want to just ask this quick question. Do you guys think God's got Alzheimer's or dementia? In other words, do you guys think God forgets? So God forgets. He doesn't take his pills in the morning. And I think it's important for us to get this, because I, some of you are laughing. But you can laugh. It's okay. Can you put Hebrews? What's that scripture? There it is. Hebrews 8. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities, their sin, and I will remember their sins no more. That word there, remember, is a very interesting word. It's meno masomai. Now, I'm going to explain to you what that means. Meno means to pause, to stop, and masomai means to choose, to chew. Not to choose, to chew. Have you guys ever seen uh, cows late in the afternoon? chewing the cud. And in the morning they go out and they just fill themselves and then later on they go stand under a tree and they go <coughs> What it means is that God has taken your sin, your iniquity and your trespass and your wickedness and he has removed it as far as the east is from the west from you. And what he does is, is he never ever ever rechews it. Brings it back. Vomits it up. And choose on it. So I want to say, if you've put your sin under the blood of Jesus, it is like it never happened. It's not that God forgets it, but he never brings that sin back to you and says, Ah, oh, there goes Monet, he stole, he's a thief. Ah, oh, there goes Monet, he slept with girls, he's a fornicator. Ah, oh, there goes Monet, he swore, he's a, a swearer. Thank you, Melani. Melani, my English expert. And so what I want to do, just as we pull this meeting to a close, is I want you to close your eyes. And I just want you to focus upon the Lord. And now I want you to be brave. There might be some of you here, you've been going to a church for your whole life. You do all the right things, you say all the right prayers, you go to all the right meetings, you even maybe go to two meetings on a Sunday and home group. But you haven't found life, you haven't found Jesus, you haven't found His voice. And you find that you still continually struggle with sin that you can't break free from. And that might be because... You haven't given your heart to Jesus. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whomever believes in him will have perpetual life. Maybe you're sitting here and you're not having perpetual life. You think, ah, oh, maybe in the future, I'll give my heart to Jesus next week. But the Bible says that you have not been promised the day of tomorrow, and that it's been appointed one for man, once for man to live and then to die. I want to say that if the Holy Spirit is working in your heart right now, you know He's working in your heart because your heart is beating in your chest. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that is drawing you to the Father. It's not the words that I've been speaking. It's the Holy Spirit that is working in your heart. And He's saying, my son, my daughter, I love you so much. You are so precious in my sight that if you were the only one, the only sheep that ran away, I would come for you. That if you were the only coin that got lost, you are so worth it. You are so precious to me that I would have come for you. And that even though you've walked away from me like the prodigal son, come back to me. I will take your shame and I will take your guilt upon myself and I will substitute it. I will give it to you new life. And so if you want life this morning, and you know if you've got life or if you don't, I want to ask that you would raise your hand so that I could pray with you, so that I can introduce you to Jesus. I met him 24 years ago. 
on a mountain top. And I said to him, Lord, I give up. I've tried it my way. I want to try it your way. And in an instant, in a moment, he took out my heart of stone and he gave me a heart of flesh. In a moment, I heard his voice. In a moment, I was so astounded because even, even the, the world looked different. The colors changed. And God wants you to have eternal life. And so if you're here this morning and you haven't got that, you've never experienced that, don't assume that you know Him if you don't know His voice. If you're wondering whether you're saved, because the Spirit testifies with our spirit and calls out, Abba, Father. Anyone here this morning that wants to be brave, wants to meet Jesus, I want to ask that you raise your hand right now. Thank you very much. There's one hand that's gone up. Thank you, sir. You can put that hand down. Is there anyone else? Don't let the fear of man hold you back. The fear of man is a snare. It's a trap. And one day you will stand before your maker. And I know God's desire is, is that you hear these words. Come into my kingdom that I've prepared for you, my good and my faithful servant. God does not want or desire anyone to perish, but he wants to give all men life. That's why he sent his son. And so one last call. If you're here this morning and you don't have Jesus in your heart, I want to ask that you would respond. Anyone else? Is there another hand? All right. All right, we can now for the rest of us look at me. Actually, don't look at me, look at Jesus. I want you to remember that God brought the flowers to take away the fear of God's anger. I want you to remember that God came looking for the one sheep, that you're not living for future glory, but you're living for a relationship now. I want you to remember that you're precious in His sight and that Jesus came to give His life for you. I want you to remember that God took your shame and your guilt away. And you might still be battling deep inside of your heart with some of these concepts. And I want to ask, you know, in James 5, verse 6, it says, Confess your sins one to another, so that you may be healed of it. And in most of the times that that word is used, it's used in this context of speaking to someone else and coming out and speaking together and telling of your sin. But once it is used in Matthew 4, I think, and Jesus says, just after the 72 come in, after the, they receive the power and they, they turn the, the Galilee and the Jerusalem and the areas upside down, and he says, Father, I thank you. Same word. I thank you that you have hidden these things and that from the wise and that you've revealed it to the babes. And I want to ask that if you've been touched in your heart this morning in one of these areas, that you would stand in thanks to God, confessing in thanks before Him. And I believe the Holy Spirit is going to come and He's going to break down barriers and He's going to cause the rivers of living water to flow inside of you. And so if that's you, just stand. We're going to go into a time of worship. The reason you're standing is you're not standing for me so that I can think I did a great preach. But the Bible says, if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, He resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so standing, it's, a, it's an action of faith. And if you feel like God's spoken to you, then stand for Jesus. Don't stand for me. Stand as a testimony that you want Him, through the power of the Spirit, to break into your heart and to bring healing.